Now, let's go back, rewind to the mid-1800s again. Last week, we saw all these experiments that demonstrated the interrelationship between electric phenomena, changing electric fields, and magnetic phenomena. Uh, and we saw that if we pass a loop of, of wire through a strong magnet, we can induce an electric current in it. So all these experiments were done by Ampere, Orsted, Faraday, and others. And once those things were known, uh, Maxwell in 1864 put it all together into these four equations that we call Maxwell's equations. And this is the fundamental basis of electromagnetic theory. It fits on a t-shirt. And if you hang around here in the physics department, you'll no doubt see people wearing t-shirts with these equations on them. Now, uh, maybe you haven't taken vector calculus, it, no matter. You can kind of get the idea. This is something involving the electric field here. It's a derivative of the electric field, and that's equal to the charge. It just says electric field lines spread out from charge. Magnetic field lines would also spread out from charge if there were any, but there aren't, so we, we set that one to zero. No magnetic charges. These last two equations tell you that if you have a time-varying magnetic field, you get an electric field perpendicularly to it. And if you have a time-varying electric field or an electric current, you get a magnetic field. So all those things sort of hang together in a very nice way. Um, as far as we know, like I say, there are no magnetic charges or magnetic currents, but you could write the equations in a very symmetric form if, uh, if there were. And people are looking for magnetic charges, but no one has ever found one yet. Even my colleague upstairs on the thir uh, third floor is doing that. So if you write down Maxwell's equations, as Maxwell did, you'll find buried in it a constant C, which is, can be defined as 1 over the square root of the product of the magnetic and electric strength constants, if you will. These are the numbers that appear in the formulas for the force, the electric force and the magnetic force, given a current or, or given an electric charge. So that's what I said, the speed of light could be determined if you know these things well enough, and it, and it was determined quite precisely. Uh, C appears in an equation that we call the wave equation involving uh, taking another time derivative of these things and putting them together, and it implies the existence of what we saw last week, electromagnetic fields that vary with time just in a vacuum. So an electromagnetic wave can be set up and propagate in a certain direction in a vacuum, like so. And uh, you have an electric field vertically and a magnetic field always 90 degrees to it. So if you sit at one point in space, electric field is going up and down, magnetic field is going left and right as the wave propagates in that direction. Now, electromagnetic waves carry energy. And you can demonstrate that with one of these sciencey toys that you can get at, uh, you know, the gift shop at some museum. It's called a radiometer. On one side it's black, the other side it's white. So the light hitting that is causing that little wheel to rotate around. So energy is really transmitted by the light to the veins on that radiometer. And eventually it slows down due to, to friction or whatever. But you can see that uh, didn't, do, didn't touch anything in there, just shined light on it and made it move. They've done more precise experiments where you shine light on a mirror and you can measure the force on the mirror. But also, uh, people have had the idea that, well, what if you go into space with uh, big aluminized sheets of, of very light plastic? Uh, you could actually make sails, solar sails that... Um, the light from the sun hits the sail, bounces off, and that puts a force on the sail. You could send your ship from uh, one place to another in the solar system just by sailing. And uh, you know, I think people are going to try to do that at least sometime in the future. But back in the late 19th century, when it was realized that electromagnetic waves should exist, uh, Mr. Hertz did an experiment to prove it. So you set up this circuit down here, which is much like what we had with the Tesla coil last week. And when you hit the switch, a battery discharges across the coil. There's a, it's a, the charge is stored in a Leyden jar. And if you get enough voltage, you'll get a spark across this gap. There are various ways to set up electric sparks, and this was a surefire way to do it. Now, if you have a spark, 
that motion of charge should create an electromagnetic disturbance which travels across the room and at the other side of his room Hertz had set up a coil with a gap in it and you know turned off the lights and looked for tiny little sparks that occurred whenever his uh, friend hit the switch over there lo and behold he could demonstrate that they existed and he could also show that uh, they have a magnetic component just by turning the, the, the loop sideways and so forth as predicted by electromagnetic theory so that was done in 1887 and Tesla immediately confirmed it and uh, of course uh, people got very interested in sending messages across large distances using this and in 1895 Marconi uh, invented a practical radio system that could be you know, u used to send Morse code over at least originally Morse code over long distances so it, it spread like wildfire and within just a few years there was broadcast radio in the United States like by about 1910 or so amazing um, technological development we, I've shown this slide a few times um, reminding you that electromagnetic waves can have really any wavelength whatsoever ranging over orders of magnitude from the shortest uh, wavelength gamma rays to the longest wavelength radio waves now we can correctly think about radio waves and let's say infrared as being long wavelength you know sort of human scale wavelength things traveling in plane waves but what we're gonna find is that when we look start to think about visible light ultraviolet x-rays this these ideas break down that having a, a, a coherent beam of, of these things does not work they start to come in individual packets particles that we're going to see so it's really the uh, short wavelength end of the spectrum where we start to run into trouble with classical electromagnetic theory and talking about light as being a, some sort of continuous electromagnetic wave but let's do one click uh, clicker question uh, Professor Conway is a ham radio operator call sign KI6 GDQ when he calls on the radio using 40 meter wavelength what is the frequency so remember speed of light C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second you can use your calculator it's just an order of magnitude problem are we talking about Hertz kilohertz megahertz or gigahertz when we do that just to give you an idea for very long radio waves what is the frequency 